Hello, everyone. My name is Kathy Flynn, and I'm the National Senior Director of Engagement for the American Liver Foundation. The ALF is the nation's largest nonprofit serving people with liver disease. Since 1976, we have provided a voice for patients and their families through education, support, research, and advocacy. Welcome to the webinar, Liver Cancer Update for 2021, presented by the American Liver Foundation's Greater New York and New Jersey Medical Advisory Council. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our expert speaker for the Liver Cancer Update for 2021, Dr. David Wolf. Dr. Wolf has more than 30 years of experience in gastroenterology and hepatology. He specializes in transplant hepatology and since 1996 has been the medical director of the liver transplant program at Westchester Medical Center. Dr. Wolf is board certified in internal medicine, gastroenterology and transplant hepatology and is a professor of clinical medicine in the Department of Medicine, Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatobiliary Diseases at New York Medical College in Valhalla, New York. In 1996, Dr. Wolf established the Liver Transplant Program at Westchester Medical Center, the first liver transplant program in the Hudson Valley region. More than 800 liver transplants have been performed at Westchester Medical Center since the program was launched. Dr. Wolf treats patients with a broad array of liver diseases and is very active in the transplant community. He lectures frequently to physician and patient organizations and is a member of the American Liver Foundation's Greater New York and New Jersey Medical Advisory Council. And now, without delay, it's my pleasure to turn over the program to Dr. Wolf. Okay, Kathleen, thank you very, very much. So it is my great pleasure today to speak on the topic of liver cancer and update for 2021. Before we get started, there are a few uh, brief housekeeping things to take care of. And the first is to thank the American Liver Foundation for uh, partnering with us. Uh, and I'd like to uh, especially thank uh, Kathleen Flynn for helping set up this talk. I also want to uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Kevin Wolf in transplant administration at Westchester Medical Center. No, no relation, but uh, but uh, Kevin and I have been uh, putting on a webinar series since the early days of the pandemic. We had our first webinar on COVID-19 and other uh, viral issues uh, back in uh, June of 2020, and we've been uh, producing monthly uh, webinars ever since then, and hopefully uh, that will continue for months and years ahead. So uh, the other key housekeeping uh, point is CME. So for those of you who are on the outside, for everybody inside Westchester Medical Center who's participating tonight, everyone is familiar with EADS. If you're not familiar with EADS, it, this is easy. Uh, just uh, uh, go to www.eads.com and sign up. Tonight's code is 75RAJA, 75 Raja, and uh, I'll be showing this slide later in the talk. The other key housekeeping point are disclosures. So here are my Speakers Bureau disclosures, but the real key disclosures are, I'm not a molecular biologist, so when it comes to the nitty gritty of talking about the issues of molecular biology, I'm not an expert, but I'll present what I know. And I'm also not a medical oncologist. And I will say that the medical oncologic aspects of dealing with patients with liver cancer are uh, becoming increasingly complex and increasingly exciting. And we're gonna to touch on them. But again, this is not necessarily my field of expertise in terms of the chemotherapeutic strategies uh, of 2021. But we can talk about some of the exciting developments that are out there. And so without further ado, let's begin our talk tonight. First, a couple brief statements about chronic liver disease in general. It is phenomenally common. There are 1.5 billion people on chronic earth who are suffering from some sort of chronic liver disease. Now, by and large, that's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And for many of these individuals, it can be a reasonably uh, inconsequential issue. But certainly there is a significant proportion of these patients, maybe up to 10%, who are gonna go on to develop non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, NASH, putting them at risk for both cirrhosis and liver cancer. There are other patients who are suffering from hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and alcoholic liver disease. 
So all told, cirrhosis accounts for about 1.2 million deaths around the globe each year, and liver cancer itself, uh, close to 800,000 deaths per year. Now, there's a different burden of mortality depending on what region of the world we're talking about. We have a, uh, uh, on the low side, we have nations like Singapore uh, in, on the green arrow, and on the high side in red, there are nations uh, like Egypt, which is inundated with uh, hepatitis uh, C cases, and also Moldova, where there is epidemic alcohol abuse, and there's just an absolutely enormous number of patients who are suffering from uh, cirrhosis. In the United States, we're seeing increasing death rates from chronic liver disease, in the, that's in the light blue over on the right, in cirrhosis with the black arrow over on the right, and liver cancer in the uh, aqua uh, arrow on the right. And I think that uh, that uh, plot on the right-hand side of the screen really, uh, unfortunately, not nicely documents the really dramatic uptick in all of these disease states in the United States over the last two decades. So if you look at U.S. cancer death statistics, the death rate for all cancers, thankfully, is on the way down. On the other hand, when it comes to cancer of the liver and cancer of the intrahepatic bile duct, it's actually on the way up. And that is why this is such an important topic tonight. When I was preparing this talk, I was thinking about my own house officership training. And there are a lot of folks who are tuned in tonight who are house officers at Westchester Medical Center. When I was a medical intern back at Columbia Presbyterian in 1985, it would be absolutely unheard of that you'd have a grand rounds on liver cancer. We were dealing with a condition that we at least perceived was not all that common. We were dealing with a condition that was, well, if you had it, it was incurable. So why bother having a grand rounds on the topic? Well, I think we're showing that this is anything but an uncommon condition and it's anything but incurable. But here is a blunt statement that liver cancer is deadly. Unfortunately, when patients come to us, and not that much has changed over the uh, last uh, decade and a half when this article came out, there's a potential for cure in only about 12% of the patients around the globe who come to us. And that's because patients are not necessarily being screened and they're late presenters. So all told, even in 2021, the one-year survival for liver cancer is about 36%, 17% uh, survival at three years, median survival of eight months. And here's a pretty typical case. This is how the patient comes to you, or at least this is the way they used to come to us. The patient's coming to us with nondescript upper abdominal pain. They've got this huge palpable upper abdominal mass. This is how they uh, come to you in the office. And this is what they look like eight weeks later with this terrible infiltrative multifocal tumor. And you can see in the, uh, uh, in the uh, microscopic film, you can see those small uh, uh, kind of bluer uh, uh, cells, those are cancer cells in the background of a reasonably normal liver tissue. Here's another blunt statement, that without effective surgery or local regional therapy, even patients with early cancer do not survive. This is a paper that came out 20 years ago from the Cancer of the Liver Italian Program, published in Hepatology. And the extraordinary thing about this paper is that these patients who were being followed elected not to have any therapy whatsoever. All they wanted to do was follow up with their physicians. You can see in the, uh, the kind of pink arrow that for patients who had multiple risk factors for bad outcomes, they had poor liver function as judged by their child turcot pew score. They had a multifocal tumor. They had a high AFP. They had portal vein thrombosis. Well, intuitively, we know these patients are going to do badly and with no therapy, no great surprise, that only 10% of these individuals were alive at 12 months and everyone had uh, succumbed to liver cancer by 18 months out. On the other hand, if you look at the red line, here are patients who presented with liver cancer with great liver function, with a single small tumor, a low AFP, nor, no portal vein thrombosis, and these are patients who elected to do absolutely nothing other than be observed. And you can see that a majority of patients were still alive 24 months into their diagnosis. And three years into their diagnosis, about 50% of patients uh, were still alive. But you can see that the, cur the curve is starting to drop off precipitously. And I have no doubt that by four years out, the vast majority of these patients would have been dead. So I, I'll stick to my statement that without effective surgery or local regional therapy, most patients are not going to survive. However, 
early liver cancer can be cured. How do we cure it? Well, usually it's a big ticket item. It's something invasive. So uh, when it comes to the local regional therapies, we can think about treatments like transarterial radioembolization that we'll be talking about later, but we have the ablative therapies like microwave ablation and radiofrequency ablation. And with small tumors, you can achieve a cancer cure rate in the neighborhood of 60 to 70% in a well-selected patient. What about liver resection, which has been the traditional gold standard for managing liver cancer? The cancer survival rates are as high as 60 to 70% for uh, small liver cancers under two centimeters. And then the real great revolution began to occur about 20 years ago with widespread use of liver transplant for the management of patients with liver cancer. And we're achieving five-year survival rates for liver cancer patients that are upwards of 70%, providing we select our patients well. Our patients with, so we stated at the outset that not everyone is going to necessarily be curable, but even for patients with advanced liver disease, there's an improving outlook. And we're going to talk about that at the later stages of this lecture. First, let's talk about the molecular pathogenesis of liver cancer. Now, you might say, okay, you're not into molecular biology. Why should you care? Well, on one level, the better we are at understanding the molecular pathogenesis of HCC, perhaps someday we're going to find a druggable target. Now, we know that many cancers, liver cancer included, develop because of mutations in, in this case, the hepatocyte genome. Mutations that were pre-existing, mutations that were acquired. And perhaps we can find a druggable target. Unfortunately, to date, we have not been particularly successful at identifying that particular mutation where we can come up with an agent that somehow can control the impact of that mutation. Another practical reason for understanding the molecular pathogenesis of liver cancer is perhaps this will aid us developing diagnostics, diagnostics that will improve our screening or surveillance of patients who are at risk for liver cancer. And if you diagnose liver cancer, it can give us a better sense of either A, how aggressive is that tumor likely to be, or B, what particular particular minimally invasive strategy or what particular drug is best suited to that patient given the molecular uh, uh, background, the, mole the molecular picture of that, uh, that liver cancer. So let's talk about the genetic predisposition that patients may have for liver cancer. And I'll introduce you to the concept of SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are genetic variants. They can be shared by individuals of common descent and classically said to be in greater than 1% of the population. And SNPs are common. We might have four to five million single nucleotide polymorphisms in my genome or your genome. SNPs may influence the occurrence and outcome of human disease. And we have seen huge advances in so-called genome-wide associated studies, GWASs, over the last uh, uh, decade, decade and a half or so. And we can identify these SNPs and try to figure out their impact on a particular disease state. And let me give you some examples that, are, that if you're working in the field of gastroenterology, you're probably aware of them. So we can look at the gene PNPLA3, which is involved in fat metabolism. And we can look at this particular SNP, the RS738409 SNP. Of course, you don't have to remember that. Who happens to have this particular single nucleotide polymorphism? Well, this is common in uh, Native Americans living in, in the Southwest. It's common in Hispanic Americans, particularly Mexican Americans. How about the gene TM6SF2, also involved with fat metabolism? Well, the particular SNP that we might be concerned about is this RS585, et cetera. Why do we care about these SNPs? Because if you are a patient who has these SNPs, that these genetic alterations, these genetic variations, are going to put you at risk for the progression of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and put you at risk for progression of alcoholic liver disease. And this may be why we see really rather horrifying rates of mortality in 
some Native American populations, Mexican American populations suffering from either NASH or alcoholic liver disease. These SNPs also predispose patients to the development of liver cancer. We may also see changes in the mutational signature that may be acquired during the course of life. And over on the left-hand side of the screen are some of these classical mutational signatures that can be associated with the development of liver cancer. And I will mention two. We can talk about a particular mutational signature that can occur in the hepatocyte genome when patients are exposed to the toxin uh, called aflatoxin B1. As many of you know, that is a toxin that is derived from the fungus Aspergillus flavus. So why should you care? It so happens that the groundnuts, think peanuts, but groundnuts are the whole global family of nuts growing under the ground. This is a huge source of calories, protein, fat, carbs for many populations around the world. It's not just a delicious salty treat that you can have tonight. This is a huge source of calories for populations around the world. And unfortunately, poorly stored uh, 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 quantities of groundnuts, particularly in a humid environment, can be uh, impacted by the fungus Aspergillus flavus and be tainted with aflatoxin. Individuals who consume aflatoxin tainted nuts can either develop acute liver issues, acute liver toxicity, but they're also at risk for insertional mutagenesis, and not excuse me, mutagenesis, period, that you can see the development of this mutation, uh, this particular genetic pattern that's marked, uh, that's uh, noted in, in red. There are also populations that are exposed to the chemical aristolochic acid. Now, again, why should we care? Well, this is a chemical that's active in a whole number of different Chinese herbs going by names like Ma Du Ling and uh, Guang Fan Ji. If you look at populations of American or European individuals with liver cancer, this particular molecular signature, look at that molecular signature near the, the blue circle, there are very few Americans or Europeans who have this particular molecular signature. But if you look at populations, oh, let's say in China or in Taiwan, depicted in the very lowest portion of the right side of the screen, you can see that there are large populations that have this particular signature. And is it because these individuals were exposed to aristolochic acid uh, while they were growing up and they were using this particular herbal compound? And the answer is perhaps. So you can see how env the environment can have an impact on the molecular picture that of the hepatocyte genome. We can also see an accumulation of genetic and epigenetic alterations. And I love this quotation that some mutations are passengers, some mutations are drivers. And some of these mutations are going to drive the development of liver cancer. We've learned an awful lot about the molecular pathogenesis of liver cancer over the last year. So we know that mutations in the gene, one of the genes responsible, uh, responsible for telomere maintenance in the, the nucleus is, uh, is TERT. And mutations in the TERT promoter can be seen in dysplastic tumors in low-grade dysplasia, in high-grade dysplasia, and finally in liver cancer. And, uh, and this is presumably how the hepatitis B virus is involved in insertional mutagenesis, that if the hepatitis B virus inserts into the hepatocyte genome, it seems to be causing damage and changes to the TERT promoter. We can also see changes related to beta-catenin and P53. These tend to occur later on in the a molecular life of the hepatocytes that destined to become a cancer cell. So these are driver mutations. So what are the risk factors for liver cancer? How, how does that impact our ability to surveil patients for liver cancer? Well, what are the goals of surveillance? We'd like to try to identify liver cancers at an early stage before they progress to a stage where the patient is no longer curable. And of course, if the liver cancer is identified, we can then send them down the road towards surgical resection, liver transplantation, or appropriate local regional therapy. Who should we surveil? Well, in the ideal world, we would either A, be getting a piece of tissue from an individual's liver, from either the cancer or from non-tumorous tissue, 
or B, we're performing a so-called liquid biopsy where we're looking at DNA that has sloughed off the liver or sloughed off a cancer into the bloodstream. And then we can better assess the mutational landscape of the liver. That's the future. And here is the future. This is a fascinating paper that came out in Nature two years ago. Here there were patients who underwent biopsy, normal individuals, patients with alcoholic liver disease, patients who had cirrhosis due to alcohol, and finally patients with cancer. The investigators were taking 48 microdissections per biopsy with about 400 hepatocytes per specimen, and they were able to sequence all of these microdissected specimens, looking for mutations, looking for both passenger mutations and driver mutations. And if you just kind of glance over at the uh, right hand side of the screen, and we'll look at this particular patient with alcoholic cirrhosis. He has a lot of these very colorful lines on his mutational profile. This is an individual who had a lot of these driver mutations as part of his hepatocyte genome. If you look way down at the bottom of the slide on the right at these liver cancers, you can see, see that the hepatocyte genomes that are being assessed in this particular study are chock full of these driver mutations. How does this impact us practically? Well, we have not really developed the tools that we're going to take from this, this really uh, important basic science paper that we can bring it directly to the lab and you can order up the appropriate biopsy or the, the appropriate blood test where we can assess for these driver mutations. But that day may come. So in the future, our hope is that we're going to be able to obtain a blood specimen and we're going to be able to assess through a so-called, quote, liquid biopsy looking for these driver mutations. Until that day comes, we're stuck with good old-fashioned epidemiology and assessing risk factors for liver cancer. The biggest risk factor, of course, is cirrhosis. And it is said that if you have a patient who has cirrhosis, regardless of cause, there is an incidence of liver cancer that's about 2 to 4% per year. Of course, hepatitis B is also a risk factor. There are plenty of patients with non-cirrhotic hepatitis B who are at risk for cancer. Now, if you're an inactive carrier for hepatitis B, your risk for developing liver cancer is rather low. But as you age, your risk becomes higher, particularly if you're over age 55, and the statistics are presented here. There are plenty of other risk factors for liver cancer as well. Non-cirrhotic hepatitis C, particularly patients with stage three, i.e. advanced fibrosis, but not quite cirrhotic. Patients with non-cirrhotic, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, are at risk for cancer. And this is a huge public health problem because you have to figure that a third of America has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, yikes. 10% of those individuals have NASH, yikes, and many of these folks are at risk for cancer. Should we be surveilling everybody? That's a huge public health question. We've already talked about aflatoxin, patients who've been exposed to anabolic steroids. And if you have a, a hepatocellular adenoma, that is positive for particular mutations in the beta, in, uh, beta catenin, these are individuals who are also at risk for the development of liver cancer. Who should we surveil? Well, this is what the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease says, and I don't necessarily agree with every recommendation. Certainly, we should be surveilling patients who have cirrhosis, but the AASLD says we should be surveilling Asian males who are hep B carriers greater than age 40 and Asian females who are hep B carriers greater than age 50, but what do you do about the 25-year-old? And, uh, and if you have an, a patient in your practice who's African or they're a North American black with hepatitis B, they should be surveilled. Okay. Where the ASLD says that the value of surveillance is uncertain in these other populations, at younger ages, hep C and stage three fibrosis and NAFLD. To their credit, the folks who wrote the practice guidelines state that for patients who've been, uh, uh, who have hepatitis C-induced cirrhosis, who've been cured of their hepatitis C through a direct-acting antiviral drug, they should still be engaged in uh, cancer screening. And indeed, just this week, we made a diagnosis of liver cancer in someone whose hepatitis C was cured years ago. And I'm not sure whether this is to the ASLD's credit or not, but ASLD says if you have a patient with child class C, don't bother. Don't screen your patient for liver cancer because that it's the hepatitis, it's the child class C, the very advanced fibrosis is more of a risk than, than having cancer. And I may or may not agree with that statement. How should we surveil? 
Well, the recommendation of the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases is that we should be employing an ultrasound with or without AFP every six months. Now, AFP has had a long history of, it, of being used for surveillance, and it's problematic because a third of patients with a, a liver cancer can have a totally normal AFP. Many patients can have an elevated AFP and not have liver cancer. There are alternative chemicals that you can order up through your favorite commercial lab or through your hospital lab. You can order the desgamma carboxyprothrombin, also called P PIVCA2. You can order AFPL3, which is really just a more specific version of, AFLP, uh, of the AFP. And two tests that I've never used before, the alpha l fucosides and the glipocan 3 What about ultrasound surveillance? Well, we should be surveilling our patients with ultrasounds every six months. If you see a small lesion, the ISLD says, go get a repeat ultrasound in three months. But what happens if you see a lesion that measures about 10 millimeters? Well, then we need to act. And, that, and to act usually means that we need to obtain a triple phase CT or a multi-phase MRI. Now, some patients are poor candidates for ultrasound screen, uh, screening to begin with. Maybe they should be getting CAT scans or ultrasounds anyway because they're of their body habitus. Maybe they're too obese to get a great window on, on the liver, and that's a good reason to be getting CAT scans or MRIs anyway. So how do you diagnose liver cancer? Now, this looks like a very complicated table, but we're going to concentrate on it, and you're going to see it's going to make our life easier. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the uh, LIRADS uh, system uh, uh, for liver imaging reporting that was originally developed back in the early 2000 teens. And this is published by the American College of Radiology. And you can see how it's assigning for a lesion in a cirrhotic liver a score of one through five, where one is a lesion that's definitely benign, let's say a liver cyst or a hemangioma, probably benign, LIRADS 2. And a, a LIRADS 3, a lesion that is indefinite for liver cancer. LIRADS 4, that's probable for liver cancer, a 75 to 95% chance that the mass represents a cancer. Or LIRADS 5, it's definite for liver cancer, greater than a 95% chance it's cancer. And we have other lesions uh, that are LIRADS M. And uh, interventional radiology and I were just talking today about a patient with a LIRADS M lesion. Here's a timeline that looks at some of the major developments in cancer diagnosis and treatment. And we should mention right now the work that was being done in the early 1990s, most notably by, a, a, by, a, 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 by a, a, a Vincenzo Mazzaferro working at Milan. And it was Mazzaferro and colleagues who found out that if you chose patients who had small tumors, a single mass less than five centimeters or up to three lesions, each less than three centimeters in size, and you perform liver transplant, that the, the four and five year survival for these individuals was equal to that of patients who were undergoing transplant for non-cancer indications. What was going on simultaneously in the radiology world is that beginning in the late 1990s, we began to see that triple phase CT and multi-phase MRIs began to have a greater than 95% positive predictive value for liver cancer. This, so EASL, the European Association for the Study of the Liver, came out with a statement in the year 2000 saying that we could dispense with biopsy, providing we had a definite diagnosis of liver cancer on MRI. ASLD was a, a little slower to uh, pick up this recommendation, but that became the law of the land in ASLD in 2005. In 2011, we saw uh, LIRADS roll out for the first time, the liver imaging reporting and data system. And that has added, uh, it's added uh, order to the chaos. I mean, there's nothing more troubling than getting a radiology report saying there is a possibly subtly enhancing lesion, which maybe could be kind of sort of could be compatible with liver cancer. That's ridiculous. Let's go try to use standardized vocabulary so we can all speak the same language. At the same time, we've seen these developments in UNOS where patients who were receiving a diagnosis of liver cancer now had a organized schema for accelerating their course on the transplant list because many of these patients have well compensated cirrhosis in a world in a transplant system that's dependent upon MELD, which is based on uh, a scoring system based on liver function. If you have a patient with great liver function, they're going to have a low MELD score. They would never get the nod for transplant. If they have cancer, we now have well organized uh, uh, rules for accelerating patients on the transplant list. And at present, our rules say 
that for any given region of the United States, let's say here in New York State, where the average MELT score at time of transplant is 31 points, you can assign to your patients who have a liver cancer diagnosis a, a, a point score that is three points less than the median MELT score at time of transplant, and uh, that would be a, a score of 28 in New York. For the next few minutes, let's talk a little bit more about liver imaging. And here's a nice illustration that I have uh, taken from a radiology uh, assistant based online. And here's a, uh, a series of CT scans with a non-enhanced CT scan in the upper left. And then we are taking advantage of dynamic imaging. One of the amazing developments we've had over the last two decades is that we have increasingly sophisticated dynamic CT and MRI imaging where we have rapid image acquisition. Back in the old days, when we didn't have rapid uh, uh, acquisition, you could just give your patient a shot of contrast and you'd obtain the contrast CT scan or, or MRI whenever, and something would light up. But now we can accurately time just how many seconds into the contrast shot is our patient moving through the scanner. So here we have contrast shots during arterial phase at 35 seconds, in portal venous phase at 70 seconds, and in delayed phase or equilibrium phase uh, uh, five or 10 minutes into the contrast shot. So let's look at arterial phase. Now, and what does this really mean? And what, what's it going to tell us? We should recall that normal liver parenchyma receives about 75% of its blood supply from the portal vein and 25% of its blood supply from the hepatic artery. Liver cancers, on the other hand, receive 100% of their blood supply from the hepatic artery. Now, there are other lesions that will receive arterial blood supply, and this includes focal nodular hyperplasia, hepatic adenomas, and hepatic hemangiomas. We should note that the surrounding non-tumorous liver parenchyma receives minimal enhancement during arterial phase. And what arterial phase really means is that that bolus of contrast you gave through the antecubital vein, it's now gone through the heart, it's been circulated out into the aorta, it's gone into the celiac axis, into the hepatic artery, it has entered the liver. In portal venous phase, well, now the patient's been uh, on, their, on, on the gurney, they've been moved out of the scanner, they've been moved back into the scanner. And in portal venous phase, there's maximum enhancement of normal liver parenchyma. And it's in the portal venous phase that we optimally see hypovascular metastases, as an example, colon cancer metastases. We might also, also optimally identify liver cysts and liver abscesses. We can see that in portal venous phase, liver cancers, as uh, suggested by, that red, by the red arrow, are beginning to wash out. They're less bright than the surrounding liver tissue. But for other lesions like focal nausea or hyperplasia and hepatic adenomas, they are iso-intense compared to surrounding liver tissue. Finally, in delayed phase, here, fibrotic lesions, these are the ones that are going to retain contrast much longer than the surrounding liver tissue. So now that you can see that the surrounding liver parenchyma is relatively dark, but this new lesion is starting to light up with, as illustrated by the yellow arrow, and that represents a cholangiocarcinoma, although some fibrotic sarcomas can also have this enhancement pattern. These are some old, old, old CT images, but they prove a point. Over on the left-hand side, we have a lesion that's lighting up an arterial phase and has a central scar, and that looks just like focal nodular hyperplasia. In the central photograph, in portal venous phase, we have a liver that's light bulb bright, but we have this hypovascular mass. And that's an example of a hypovascular metastasis, e.g. colon cancer metastasis. And finally, in delayed phase, we have this bright lesion that's much brighter than the surrounding liver tissue, and that's a cholangiocarcinoma. I love this slide. And this is an extremely instructive slide. And it's all, this is to make you as a physician or other healthcare provider a better consumer of radiology studies. This is a classical scan of, an of a liver and arterial aphase, and we can see with the blue arrow, the aorta is lighting up, and with that uh, uh, yellow arrow, there's this little squiggle of uh, contrast going through a branch of the hepatic artery, and there's not much else going on in the liver. So here the patient was moved through the scanner 18 seconds after the contrast shot as contrast is just starting to enter the hepatic artery. But if you move the patient back through the scanner 
35 seconds into the contrast shot, when you're supposed to be moving them in for optimal arterial phase, you see this gigantic hyper-enhancing mass in the right lobe of the liver. What's different on these scans, aside from the gigantic mass, is that you can see that there's now contrast, as noted in red, that is starting to fill into the portal vein. So for you as a consumer of radiologic studies, look at your studies and was your was the timing of your st study optimal or not? And it could be you can make that decision as a non-radiologist simply by looking at the portal vein. What's the enhancement pattern of the portal vein? What does tumor washout look like? Well, these are scans that unfortunately were, were taken in a patient of mine about 20 years ago. Here is a, a cirrhotic liver, there's surrounding ascites, and there's this hypodense mass on a non-IV contrast CT. You can see some contrast in the stomach, oral contrast. But here in arterial phase, the aorta is lighting up. We have this large hypervascular mass in the right lobe of the liver. And here is a nice example, unfortunately for this patient, of washout in portal venous phase as the liver is getting bright and the mass is getting dark. That's tumor washout. On MRI, here we have, you can on the non-enhanced scan, you can barely see anything, but we have an arterial enhancing mass in, art, in portal venous, excuse me, in arterial phase. Uh, don't see very much on this scan in portal venous phase, but on the delayed phase, you can clearly see washout on delayed phase. And that's why arterial and portal venous phase alone are not good enough. You need a delayed phase because you may pick up a uh, hypo enhancement, i.e. washout in the delayed phase. On MRI, we expect that our liver cancers are going to be T1 hypo-intense and T2 hyper-intense, and there may be an enhancing capsule, as you can see in these nice examples of small liver cancers on MRI. Here, we're going to start to introduce the concept of uh, how our uh, interpretation of uh, uh, of the MRI, uh, we can use the LIRADS uh, categorization to help us better determine are we dealing with a arterial enhancing lesion that is suspicious or not suspicious for liver cancer. And this is going to look like a complicated table. I can assure you that every member of the transplant team has memorized this table. And we're going to go through it. So here is a patient who has a uh, arterial phase hyper enhancement of a mass in the liver. So what is it? That it, there it is on arterial phase, but in portal venous phase, you can see that the mass has washed out, but there's an enhancing capsule. So there's the washout, and you can see the enhancing capsule. And what we can then do is go down to our table and say, okay, it's the mass is bigger than two centimeters in size. It has an enhancing capsule, has non peripheral washout, giving it two characteristics, and that gives it a score of LIRADS 5. So this is a lesion that is definite for liver cancer, definite meaning 95, 96% uh, likelihood that, yes, it is liver cancer and nothing but liver cancer. Here's another mass, maybe a little more challenging. Here we have another mass that is demonstrating arterial phase hyperenhancement. But here there is, there's washout again, there's no capsule, but it's less than 20 centimeter, 20 millimeters, it's only 17 millimeters, but we go down to our LIRADS checklist, okay, there is uh, not much of an enhancing uh, capsule, but there is washout. It, we can't say whether or not there's been threshold growth, but this still qualifies as a LIRADS 5 lesion, definite for liver cancer, albeit under 20 millimeters in size. Here, a somewhat more complicated case. Here we have a mass where there is no arterial phase hyperenhancement, but there is washout, but there is threshold growth. And you can see that it's grown more than 50% in size over the last six months. We go back to our table. So there's no enhancing capsule, but there is washout and there's threshold growth. And this is a LIRADS 4 lesion that's probable for liver cancer. It's 75 to 95% chance it's a liver cancer. Just how accurate are CT scans and MRIs? And here's a re relatively recent article that looks at accuracy, that when we identify a lesion and your radiologist calls it as LIRADS 3, there's about a 30% chance it's liver cancer. If it's LIRADS 4, there's upwards of 70% chance it's liver cancer and LIRADS 5. In this study, it's 94, but let's just say 95, 96% chance it is definitely liver cancer. What about LIRADS M? Well, you get a, a score back that says LIRADS M, be worried. Maybe it's not liver cancer, but maybe it's something else. Maybe it's cholangiocarcinoma. 
which can be arterially enhancing and may be difficult to differentiate from HCC. We can use our radiologic findings to help stage tumors, and this is very important for, for those of us who work in the field of transplant, because we it, that it's only patients with stage two tumors, a single lesion between two and five centimeters, or three lesions each less than three centimeters within within so-called Milan criteria, who are going to be able to get accelerated on the transplant list. But that doesn't mean that we can't downstage some patients with stage three tumor, stage one tum uh, tumors under two centimeters don't get accelerated on the transplant list. What's the rationale for using a radiology-based system? Well, the pros are we have uh, studies that if they are read as LIRAS-5, 94, 95, 96% likelihood of cancer, that's very high. If you think about the accuracy of biopsies, you can have a mass, you can have your needle right smack dab in the middle of the mass, confirm it with interventional radiology, but up to 30% of the time, you end up with a biopsy that is non-diagnostic for liver cancer. Not only that, but it's an invasive procedure. There's a chance we can cause bleeding, and there is a small but real chance that you can cause tumor tracking, as, I, as, as uh, noted over in the illustration on the left. The cons of using a radiology-based system are we can misclassify dysplastic nodules, so we might say that something's cancerous when it's only precancerous. We might misdiagnose other tumors. And also, with developments in molecular biology, you can see that at very sophisticated labs with, with molecular biology capabilities, we may be able to uh, better determine the natural history of that particular tumor by understanding the, uh, uh, the mutation pattern within that individual tumor. Let's get back to the clinic. How do we stage liver cancer? Again, it's a complicated looking slide, but it's really rather straightforward. So this is the Barcelona clinic liver cancer scoring system that has evolved over the last two decades. And what the Barcelona, there are many other competing systems out there. This is the one that's probably used most commonly around the world. What the BCLC system also includes is a kind of a gross sense of liver function and also the patient's functional status, their ECOG status, where ECOG zero is in good shape and ECOG two, pretty bad shape. Where you are on this table in terms of very early stage all the way up to advanced stage can help determine what type of therapy that we should be choosing as clinicians. And let's go through it. Let's talk about very early stage patients. These are patients who have a liver cancer that is less than two centimeters in size. And these are individuals that we may be slating down the road toward an ablative therapy, think microwave ablation, or maybe surgical resection. On the other hand, for patients with so-called early stage disease, so now we have a tumor that's, let's say, between two and five centimeters or three lesions less than three, so they're within Milan criteria, maybe we could resect them if they've got great liver function and depending on the location of the, the masses, or perhaps the patient's going down the road toward ablative therapy, or perhaps the patient is going down the road toward liver transplant. For patients with intermediate stage cancers, these are patients who are beyond Milan criteria. Well, there's intermediate stage and there's intermediate stage. There are some patients who are going to be able to downstage back into early stage treatment so that perhaps we can offer them transplant. But there are other patients who are not downstageable. They're stuck there in intermediate stage. And perhaps these are the patients where we're offering chemoembolization. For patients with advanced stage cancer, here are folks with multiple tumor masses, masses or there is macrovascular invasion, portal vein invasion bone metastases, these are individuals who are going to benefit from some sort of systemic therapy. And finally, we need to recognize, unfortunately, that some of our patients have a terminal stage, Barcelona stage D. And these are individuals where we should be offering best supportive care. Think palliative care. And we just had uh, one such individual discharged from the liver service at Westchester. How do we treat liver cancer? Well, it depends on staging and depends on liver function. We said at the outset, it's only a minority of individuals who are going to be potentially curable, unfortunately. But the decision what therapy to, to make can be extremely complicated and really needs to be made in a multidisciplinary setting. And maybe this is my bias from having worked in transplant centers for the last 30 years. But from my, in my opinion, that these are the sorts of decisions you best are, that are best made in transplant programs, where at least transplant is on the table as a potential option. But we need to take into account 
the risk of the procedure, the risk for tumor recurrence, there's an awful lot that we take into account when we meet as a tumor board once a week. What about liver resection, the classical therapy for liver cancer? We have to keep in mind that most of the time, liver cancer is arising in the setting of cirrhosis. And when surgeons are operating on the cirrhotic liver, we have to remember that the cirrhotic liver does not regenerate as well as a normal liver. So if, let's say, I underwent liver resection, my surgical colleagues could remove up to three quarters of my liver and I'd survive and thrive. On the other hand, if you're operating in the cirrhotic patient, it is rare that you uh, remove more than 50% of the liver because even when you're removing smaller volumes of liver, you're putting your patient at risk for liver decompensation. One of the ways we have to minimize the risk for liver decompensation is to perform portal vein embolization. And we can do this in the weeks leading up to a liver resection where you can embolize the side of the liver, which is ultimately going to be resected. And that's going to lead to growth hypertrophy of the contralateral liver, which is going to be the liver remnant. And this way we can help protect the patient uh, after uh, and thrive after their resection. We have to recall that severe portal hypertension is a contraindication to resection. And we know that it can lead to in increased risks for intraoperative bleeding, increased risks for liver decompensation, and we can see an increase in portal pressure, perhaps leading to a variceal bleed. We can predict portal hypertension, not just by doing upper endoscopies, but we can look at the patient's liver function. And we can use the old-fashioned child turcot pew system that was developed in the 1960s and 1970s, but we still use it today. And it's easy to do. You can calculate this in your head. It's give a score of one, two, or three points, depending on the severity of encephalopathy, ascites, bilirubin, albumin, and the INR. And now, of course, we could also use the more modern meld or meld sodium score but suffice it to say, if you have a patient who's child class A or they've got a low MELD score, you might be able to consider, consider them for a major liver resection. Child class B, maybe a minor liver resection. Maybe they could tolerate a resection of the lateral segment of the left lobe of the liver, move segment two, remove segment three. Child class C, forget about it. You can't perform a liver resection without endangering your patient. So we need to keep all these factors in mind as we think about liver resection, the severity of the underlying liver disease, the severity of portal hypertension, the size of the tumor. Uh, was there a tumor rupture? Was there a metastasis? How high is the AFP? What's the likelihood we're going to achieve negative surgical margins? In some cases, liver transplant is superior to resection, particularly in patients with portal hypertension, particularly in patients who are in that classical Milan criteria, single lesion less than five, three lesions less than three. The other potential benefits of transplant are that we're going to be removing the entire cirrhotic liver, which is this milieu for forming cancer. Also, because typically patients have a wait time, and that wait for transplant, if they're undergoing a, uh, a, a typical cadaveric transplant in New York, that wait is going to be more than a year. It's going to allow tumor biology to play out. So we're not going to be uh, immediately diving in and performing transplant or doing surgery on a patient who's got bad tumor biology with a very aggressive tumor. Also, by performing transplant, we're going to eliminate the risk of post-op liver failure, which is potentially a risk when you're performing a liver resection. Clearly, there are some major risks to transplant. There are long waiting times. You, need, you still have a cancer. You still have to do something to control the cancer. That uh, cancer could grow while the patient's on the, on the wait list. That patient may drop off the wait list, which is a very sanitized term to say they're their cancer could grow and spread and make them non-transplantable. And also with, with, uh, with liver transplant, there's serious risks, including the risk, the long, need for long-term liver resection. So just how good are we doing with liver resection for cancer? You can see survival rates all over the place. Five-year survival rates in the reported literature, anywhere from 17 to 72%, but it all depends on how you select your patients. When it comes to transplant, we're typically identifying these patients who are within Milan criteria, but occasionally patients with multifocal tumors that are a little outside Milan within so-called UCSF criteria, occasionally patients with larger tumors. The goal is to try to perform transplant before there's cancer growth, vascular invasion, metastasis, and the ultimate goal is cancer cure and a happy, healthy life. We talked before about how liver cancer patients are accelerated on the transplant list. Now, there are a number of ways of speeding up the patient's course to transplant. One would be live donor liver transplant. 
but here you're going to be putting a healthy person, some loved one of the prospective uh, uh, recipient, in a, you're going to put that individual in harm's way. So now you're doing surgery in two people. The other more common strategy is offer that patient local or regional therapy to try to control or prevent tumor growth. Just how well are we doing with liver transplant? And I think the answer is astoundingly well, that if you look at liver cancer cases, you can see that the five-year survival for liver cancer uh, cases equals that for non-liver cancer cases. So we expect that our patient's five-year survival is going to be in the neighborhood about 75% or so. Let's talk about local regional therapy. What are our goals of treatment? Well, it all depends on which patient population are we addressing. If you have a patient who's got a very early stage or early stage uh, cancer, the typically the patients who are coming to my practice, our goal is cure, cancer cure. And that local regional therapy could also be used as a bridge to transplant or a bridge to resection. On the other hand, if you have a practice where you primarily have patients with intermediate stage cancers, well, cancer cure is really not the goal. Bridge to transplant is not the goal. Rather, we're just trying to prolong survival. It's really unclear in patients with advanced cancer whether local regional therapy has any utility. So what are these local regional therapies? These are the main ones that are in use today. Microwave ablation, transarterial chemoembolization, and transarterial radioembolization, also known as yttrium-90 or Y90. So you can see that our goals could be control cancer while the patient awaits transplant. Sometimes we're using ablative therapy for cure in a patient with a very small tumor. But we are also using these local, these local regional therapies for patients who are not candidates for resection or transplant. Systemic therapy, we're typically reserving for patients who are non-resectable and non-transplantable. The main local regional therapies that are percutaneous or needle-based include percutaneous ethanol injection, radiofrequency ablation, and microwave. Here's ethanol, which is the oldest therapy going back to the early 1970s, but it's still used today. So if you have a tumor that's in a problematic location, here we have a small central tumor uh, that's abutting uh, major bile ducts and the portal vein and the hepatic artery. It's d difficult to reach. You can see in the middle uh, uh, photograph, we have the needle entering the liver. We're delivering uh, several cc's of 100% alcohol. And one month after the injection, this beautiful result where you no longer see tumor in the central liver. Here is radiofrequency ablation, which is still used every now and then. You can see the antennae on this radiofrequency ablation probe that are being deployed. And by uh, turning on the electricity, we can em emit these radio waves just generating a lot of heat. And we're literally going to cause coagulative necrosis of tumor. Microwave has been the major workhorse here at Westchester. You can see the various microwave probes that you can use. You can put in one tube probe, you can put in multiple probes, and the concept here is that by emitting huge amounts of microwave energy, think about your microwave oven at home, you're going to cause molecular frictional heating, agitate water molecules, cause cell membranes to rupture, and that is going to kill off tumor within a centimeter or two centimeters of the tip of the needle. There are a lot of advantages of microwave over radiofrequency ablation. There's a larger ablation zone. There's less of a heat sink effect. So in other words, the heat won't be carried away by blood flow through the portal vein. And you can insert multiple probes. We can even cure some small tumors with the appropriate use of microwave ablation. And here's a nice example. Here's a small cancer in the left lobe of the liver. In the photograph on the left, in the central photograph, you can see the microwave probe in place for a patient on the CAT scan table under general anesthesia because this procedure can hurt. You need general anesthesia. And here you see the result on the right one month later where you see this ablation zone and the tumor is gone. What about the transarterial therapies? Recall that liver cancer primarily has an, an arterial blood supply where most of the blood supply to the rest of the liver is portal venous. There are a whole number of different therapies. We can use conventional uh, chemo, uh, chemo embolization where we might be using lipidol, which is an oil-based therapy that's loaded with chemotherapeutic drugs. We can use drug-eluting beads, uh, and typically it's doxorubicin that is loaded onto the drug-eluting bead that is then delivered via catheter to the segment of the liver that contains the tumor. There's so-called bland embolization, where we're just uh, injecting particles to, to, into small blood vessels in that, uh, in those, that are supplying the tumor, and that's going to cause ischemia, 
to that region of the liver and cause ischemia of the tumor. And finally, there's transarterial radionormalization, also known as yttrium-90 or Y90. Our goals of treatment really depend on the stage of the tumor. Perhaps it's cancer control while the patient's waiting for transplant, but perhaps for a patient with more advanced disease, we really are just trying to slow or hold tumor growth and prolong survival. TACE, DEB-TACE, transarterial radioembolization, these are true embolization procedures where we're trying to cause ischemic necrosis. And presumably chemotherapy is helping by loading chemotherapy in, this, in addition to that particle, we can actually uh, really assure that we're getting a good cancer kill. In contrast, when it comes to radioembolization, these are rather small particles, and then it's not really an embolization per se. You're just trying to deliver this very small particle which is loaded with a beta emitter into that region of the liver so you can cause an awful lot of radiation-induced damage, damage to uh, the creation of reactive oxygen species and ultimately, uh, ultimately cellular apoptosis. Taste, deb taste, transarterial radioembolization, they can improve survival. And that's great. Now, with transarterial radioembolization, at least as of now, survival rates seem to be more or less similar to that of TACE, although there definitely are improvements in time to progression. And it, we are more successful at taking patients with intermediate stage cancer and downstaging them back into early stage cancer. We're tending to rely an awful lot on transarterial radioembolization these days. Furthermore, it's a much safer procedure in patients who have a portal vein thrombus. One of the downsides of transarterial radioembolization is you need two procedures. You need a so-called planning angiogram where you're delivering a small dose of a medical radionuclide into the liver to make sure it lands in the liver and doesn't go anywhere else because you'd hate to have it where your patient's undergoing transarterial radioembolization and the your big dose of that beta emitter is getting loosed out of the systemic circulation, let's say going to the lungs and causing a radiation pneumonitis that could be deadly. So you need to do two angiograms. So typically at Westchester, we're doing our planning angiogram. We make sure that there is no big shunt of this arterial delivered material, uh, of the arterially delivered material. Uh, there's no big shunt. It's not going to get loosed out to the lungs. And as long as there's no shunt, no significant shunt, we can uh, then plan for, uh, we can order the, uh, uh, the Y90 material from the manufacturer and plan for the actual therapy two weeks later. So typically, so here's a nice photograph of uh, taste in action, and we're seeing uh, here a great result of a pretty big tumor, 2.8 centimeter tumor, and the central photograph and the photograph on the right, beautiful results where there's significant tumor necrosis. Here, an introduction to Y90, this treatment where we can use it for early, intermediate, or advanced stage cancer. We may be able to use it for patients who are not eligible for ablation. Perhaps we can use, uh, perform it uh, a radiation lobectomy. We can do, use it in large tumors, aggressive tumors, and we can use it in patients with portal vein invasion. Perhaps use it as well in patients who are poor responders to taste, patients with poor functional status. And we've tried to use it at Westchester as a bridge to transplant. Beautiful example here of a individual with a large tumor in the right lobe of the liver. There it is on the coronal views of the uh, uh, of, of the uh, the scan. During angiogram, you can uh, see this, the uh, tumor uh, blush uh, during the angiogram, and then during the uh, the uh, the nuclear medicine scan that you can see we, we've taken we've given a dose of uh, of Y90 into the patient, you bring the patient to nuclear medicine just to confirm where all the radiation went, and you can see this enormous radioactive glow in the upper right uh, lobe of the liver. There it is during treatment, and here's the patient three months later with this absolutely fantastic result with, where there's uh, really you know excellent tumor necrosis. There's no residual or recurrent tumor, and this is a person who did very well. Here are some other examples of Y90, a large tumor undergoing Y90 treatment. Sometimes what we've learned over the years is it can take several months, maybe up to a year, to really see tumor necrosis. So if we still see arterial enhancement on our one-month, three-month, six-month scans, it doesn't necessarily mean that tumor persists or tumor has recurred. It just takes a long time to see true tumor necrosis. A lot of times we're seeing treatment effect, and that can be very a little difficult to you know, figure out is it treatment effect or is it residual tumor 
Uh, it just takes time and patience. Here's an example of a mass in the uh, central portion of the liver. It looks like segment uh, four to me. And the patient undergoes a radiation segmentectomy. And we can see this large swath of liver that has been successfully treated with Y90 and the tumor is gone. What about Y90 for cure? Fascinating study that just came out a few years ago. 70 patients on the older side, all trial class A's, all small tumors undergo radiation segmentectomy, and the results are phenomenal. You can see that for the individuals with small tumors under three centimeters, they were achieving five year cure rates of 75% with radioembolization. And even for patients who had a tumor bigger than three centimeters, they were still achieving cure in a significant proportion of patients. So I think that we're really at the dawn of being able to use Y90 to attempt to achieve cure, perhaps in patients who are not the best candidates for liver transplant. To finish up, let's talk about the systemic therapies. And if you go back not all that long ago, if you looked at the chemotherapeutic approaches for liver cancer, the results were dismal. These are response rates, not cure rates, response rates. Did the tumor shrink at all? And look at the results for fluorouracil, 0%. For doxorubicin, 7%. It's just terrible response rates. But now it's a new world, and we can use targeted drug therapy for liver cancer. Liver cancer is a vascular tumor. It requires angiogenesis to grow, and we have all these great drugs that can target growth factors. We can target vascular endothelial growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, epidermal growth factor, uh, uh, the RAF kinase, and other pathways that are involved with tumor growth. One drug that we've had on the shelf since late 2007, early 2008, is serafin, a brand name Nexavar. And it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that targeted vascular endothelial growth factor and platelet derived uh, growth factor and the RAS MAPK uh, uh, pathway. And it had reasonable efficacy, which we'll show in a second. Move forward into the modern era, we now have another tyrosine kinase inhibitor, Lenvatinib, brand name Lenvima. And here we have a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that can uh, target uh, uh, the VEGF receptor and platelet derived growth factor. And then we've seen an explosion of new drugs for liver cancer. Some of them are tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and some of them are immunoecologic therapy. We've got regorafenib, which is a VEGF receptor inhibitor. We have, uh, uh, we have Avastin, uh, Bevacizumab, which is a mono intravenous monoclonal antibody against VEGF. And then we're entering the IO world, immunotherapy. And here's, I don't claim to be an expert in immunotherapy. I'm not an expert in immunotherapy. And here's this enormously complicated slide to, talking about all the potential therapeutic options that are out there in the world of immunotherapy over the years ahead. We are beginning to just get a taste of what immune checkpoint inhibitors can do. So what is an immune checkpoint? It's a membrane-bound molecule that fine-tunes the immune response. And most immune checkpoints have some immunosuppressant activity, notably CTLA-4 and PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors. What, and here are some of the commercial compounds that are out there that can either inhibit PD-1 or PD-L1. So what is PD-L1? This is the programmed death ligand 1, and it is expressed in antigen-presenting cells and upon binding to its ligands, PD-1 will then inhibit the activation of CD4 and CD8 positive cells. What we know is that cancer cells may express PD-L1 to escape immunosurveillance, and if you can blockade either PD-1 or PD-L1, this will permit T cells to help kill tumor cells. And I think the illustration on the right is, is one of the best illustrations I've found that you can see that we now have drugs that can block PD-1 on the T cell or PD-L1, uh, the program death ligand one, on the tumor cell, and by blocking one or the other, we can then uh, let uh, that T cell finally attack the tumor cell, leading to the death of tumor cells. Let's talk about the efficacy of our drugs. So the first drug that uh, uh, received attention was serafinib back, and here's the SHARP trial that got published in 2008, looking at patients with BCL, uh, BCLC uh, stage B and C tumors, 
they were not uh, eligible, they were non-transplantable, non-resectable. And you can see there was a statistically significant, but rather small improvement in time to progression and median survival. Enter the current decade, and we have the REFLECT trial of 2018. So now it's lenvatinib versus serafinib. And they're more or less equally efficacious, but there's improved median time to progression. Some of the side effects you get with serafinib, like hand-foot syndrome, the palmar plantar uh, erythrodysesthesia, you don't get with lenvatinib particularly, but you do get more high blood pressure and weight loss with uh, lenvatinib. And then another very exciting trial that was uh, published last year, the I Am Brave trial. So here is a trial combining adalizumab, which is a in inhibitor of PDL1, and bevacizumab that targets VEGF. And really ex extremely exciting, this trial is not yet done yet, that where within the serafinib arm of the trial, patients had a median survival of 13.2 months. With atezobev, it's not yet available. You can see that patients are still surviving. So this is exceedingly exciting and, and really our first taste of what, uh, of, uh, what uh, IO therapy can do for our patients. So here's the current landscape. The first line therapies are atezobev, also serafinib, also lenvatinib. So perhaps we don't want to use uh, atezolizumab, bevacizumab in a patient who just had a variceal bleed. That would be a, a big no-no. Maybe that patient's more appropriate for serafinib or lenvatinib. And here are the other second-line therapies that are all lined up, an extremely complicated slide. And I think the, in the oncologic world, we're still trying to figure out what drugs are best for which patients. So what does the future look like? I think we need to see advances in the public health sphere. We are, we are having a better reach to our patients with hepatitis B and slowly shrinking the population of individuals around the world with hepatitis B who are at risk for liver cancer. With hepatitis C, while we made until 2010 great strides in terms of reducing the number of hep C cases, unfortunately hepatitis C is on the rise. That means the risk for liver cancer on the future will be on the rise in this disease population. Unfortunately, we're seeing increases in the number of our patients with alcoholic liver disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I think that these disease states have to be recognized for what they are, which is a public health emergency. But that being said, we are seeing improvements in surveillance. We see more and more individuals who are entering into surveillance programs. We're seeing the better development of our curative therapies, a better use of liver resection, liver transplant, and Y90. We're witnessing better understanding of the molecular pathogenesis of liver cancer. We're seeing advances in systemic therapy. And finally, we're seeing advances in immuno-oncology. So I think that the future is looking up, and we don't have a disease that is rare. We don't have a disease that's incurable. We have a disease that, unfortunately, is all too common, but the treatments are getting better and better, and I think that's what the future holds. So that's it for my formal comments and for my one housekeep, my final housekeeping uh, word of the night. Uh, here is the CME information. The code is 75RAJA, sign it to EADS, get your CME credit and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Wolf. Now we're gonna move into our Q&A session so that Dr. Wolf can address any questions that came in during his presentation. Um, at this time, we're opening up to gallery view. So if you are comfortable, we invite you to turn on your cameras and unmute yourself if you do have any questions for our speaker today. And, and if, you're not, if you're not comfortable, we'll, we'll take your disembodied voice too. <laughs> So Dr. Wolf, I did have a question to start us off. Um, you mentioned a little bit about alpha fetoprotein and other biomarkers. Do you foresee these other biomarkers having a larger role in HCC surveillance in the future? Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, this is the first step on the road toward a uh, more accurate liquid biopsy. Uh, I've ordered up uh, PIVCA2 before. Um, I can't say that I'm astounded by it. Uh, uh, I've used it when I was uh, questioning an AFP result, but it, it has not been a mainstay of diagnosis. Sure. Yeah. David, can you hear me? 
Hello, Dr. Wayne. How are you, sir? Uh, hi, David. Hi. Here's a question. You, you mentioned that the AASLD recommends screening all Africans who have hepatitis B. That so, is my reading of right. the ASLD practice guidelines. And right. so if, you, if you've got you then, Google open in front of you, you might be able to access it faster than me. Right. <laughs> would, would you then recommend treating all hepatitis B positive patients who are Africans? Let's say a 25-year-old who's got immune tolerance phase that uh, comes the, from Ghana? That, the, 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 that, that's a loaded question. It is uh, a loaded question. <laughs> that's why I'm asking it. The... Uh, it, it, uh, Peter, as you know, there are those who like to treat and those who don't like to treat. There's the right. school of thought. You have the kind of the conservative school of thought led by Anna Locke at University of Michigan, right. uh, which has advocated uh, really holding off until patients have, quote, active hepatitis B. So the immune tolerant patients uh, have not been the recipients of treatment. Right. For me, if you have a hepatitis B, you know, th th this is a uh, uh, getting back to, uh, oh my goodness, what, uh, what trial am I, I, it was on the tip of my tongue there for a second, 2005 out of Taiwan, help me out here, Peter, but, uh, uh, I'll have someone yeah, chime sure. in in a second. You, that, you, that, that was, but, that was mostly men and older people. But right? we're, but we're looking at, but we, you know, you and I know that right. markedly elevated HPV DNA levels are associated with an increased risk right. for cancer. So when I have that young person in my office, the 25 year old, with an HPV DNA of uh, 100 million, and yes, there are AST, ALT, or 20 and 20, I am very tempted to treat. Uh, so put me in that group of uh, physician treaters who do not follow the strict practice guidelines. So I think, you know, on the, on the other hand, if you have a patient who's an inactive carrier with a low viral load, uh, there is little or no utility for treatment. Uh, the other uh, uh, Studies, uh, you know, the the uh, uh, the the studies looking at the so-called gray zone patients, they also help guide us that if you you might have a person with the borderline HPV DNA elevation, but they have a strong family history for liver cancer, or they've got a, a BCP mutation, that person you're going to treat. I hope that helps. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'll think of that trial in a second. I know, I know it on the tip of my tongue. Any other questions, Kat? Hello, this is Dr. Victor Levy. Can you hear me? I hear you, Dr. Levy. Very nice. Um, I've, I've spoken to you before, Dr. Wolf. I've always appreciated your input on patients of mine at the uh, in the Bassett Health System. Yes. Um, specifically, can you address patients with hemochromatosis? Genetic hemochromatosis sure. in your experience, as well as uh, the, uh, the the sidebar, if you will, patients before any advanced uh, cirrhotic disease, before any evidence of stosis with a child who score oh. maybe very low and have developed uh, their cancer in that instance in the absence of cirrhosis. Great question. So we know that patients with hereditary hemochromatosis and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency are at particularly high risk for developing liver cancer. That being said, the surveillance interval is still the same. No one has ever gone online to say, oh, we need to be doing scans every three months. We're still doing scans every six months in cirrhotics with hemochromatosis and cirrhotics with alpha-1. But, but you asked another really provocative question. What do you do for the non-cirrhotic patient? And I have to tell you, I am nervous about my non-cirrhotic patients with hereditary hemochromatosis. I have no idea when they're, when, when they're going to experience some sort of uh, the development of some sort of dri driver mutation that's going to send them down the road toward cancer. So perhaps I'm not getting sonograms or other scans twice a year, but I'll certainly get them once a year. I'll check their AFP at least once a year. I do, you know, I, I think it's going to be relatively unlikely I'm going to pick up a uh, liver cancer case, but it's possible I could. Ditto in my patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I know it's against practice guidelines, but for me, I would rather err on the side of getting a annual sonogram in a patient with non-cirrhotic NASH and pick up a cancer, albeit not at a very high rate. I will err on the side of committing them to at least some sort of sonographic surveillance program. But again, 
that's not in practice guidelines. That's my personal opinion and personal approach. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And we have time for another one more question from the audience. And so if anyone else has a burning question, please unmute yourself at this time or feel free to populate into the chat box. All right. If there's no other questions out there, I'd like to turn the program back over to Kathy to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolf, for such a robust presentation and for all of you for submitting your questions during this presentation. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Ms. Evans and Ms. Flint, thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Kat and Dr. Wolf. Um, as a reminder, all of our attendees will receive an email with a link to view this webinar on demand and a link for a program survey. We thank you in advance for taking the survey. It will take just a minute or two, um, as it really helps us at ALF when we begin to plan future educational initiatives. For more information about liver cancer and other liver-related topics, I invite you to visit the American Liver Foundation's website, liverfoundation.org. And I also encourage you to share our website with your patients and colleagues. Um, we also invite you to follow the American Liver Foundation on Facebook and YouTube if you don't already do so. Um, and before we wrap up, just a, a sincere thank you to Dr. David Wolf from Westchester Medical Center for sharing his expertise and providing valuable, a valuable update on liver cancer. Um, and a very special thank you to Dr. Kevin Wolf from Westchester Medical Center's Transplant Administration for his assistance in bringing this program to tr uh, fruition. By the way, Dr. Kevin Wolf and Dr. David Wolf are not related. They even spell their names differently, but I put that disclaimer in there for you. Um, this webinar is now concluded. We thank you for attending, and we do hope to see you at future educational events presented by the American Liver Foundation.